Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. I uh, am really just that, the moderator only. I'm, uh, my job is to get out of the way and let uh, these two esteemed gentlemen uh, talk about a, uh, a topic that they know well. Our discussion is going to be around the death of traditional data integration, how the changing nature of IT mandates new approaches and technologies. And with me today, uh, I have David Linthicum and Gaurav Dillon. Uh, I'll just give you a quick introduction to two people that I think uh, many of you uh, don't need to be introduced to, uh, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, David is the SVP at, Cl of, at Cloud Technology Partners, an internationally recognized industry expert and thought leader. Dave has authored 13 books on computing, the latest of which is Cloud Computing and SOA Convergence in Your Enterprise, a Step-by-Step -step Approach. Dave's industry expertise includes tenures as, as CTO and CEO of several successful software companies and upper-level management positions in Fortune 100 companies. He keynotes leading technology conferences on cloud computing, SOA, enterprise app integration, and enterprise architecture. He writes on the uh, cloud computing blog for InfoWorld, and he's someone who is able to write uh, and crank out some amazing content uh, at, at an incredible pace. So uh, welcome uh, to you, Dave. Um, Thank you very I much, Darren. Oh, great. So I also have with me uh, Gaurav Dillon, who is the co-founder, chairman, and uh, CEO of SnapLogic, the industry's first cloud app and data integration platform as a service. Gaurav co-founded Informatica and was CEO of the company for more than 12 years, where he led Informatica from a startup idea to a leading software enterprise with customers and operations around the world. His tenure at Informatica included the initial uh, company launch, a successful IPO, and expansion to Europe and Asia. So welcome uh, to you, Gaurav. Great to be here, Darren. So what we want to do today is, is really make this a discussion, a conversation. Um, we have a few slides, but they're really launching uh, p pads or points into the broader uh, topics that we've identified as, as really important to you all uh, and I think important to the industry. So my first uh, introduction question is going to be asking both Dave and Gaurav to give us uh, their view of what's happening in the market. And then we'll be launching into topics around big data. We'll talk about the data lake versus the data warehouse. And of course, you know, bringing around this theme of integration and what's different uh, and, and, and why it's time to rethink your overall approach to integration. We'll wrap up the discussion with some, some specific do's and don'ts and some next steps. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dave, just to give us a, a quick run through of some of the things you're seeing uh, in your world, working with your clients and customers and, and, and talking to folks in the industry. Well, thank you very much, Darren. Well, the big thing, and this is really kind of a core message that comes out of this webinar, which is a very important webinar, by the way, which really is uh, should reveal to you the way in which we're going to do integration going forward and the reason why we have to rethink a lot of our approaches in technology. So the mega trend, the first one that I see is the new approaches to managing data as well as the rapid growth of data make traditional integration technology unusable. And that's a pretty strong statement, but let me back it up with some things that are going on. The fact of the matter is is that the cloud integration trend, the utilization of data lakes, the utilization of unstructured information, the big data systems that we're seeing out there, the complex data analytics, uh, and the ability to consume and deal with petabytes of information in one single scoop is something where traditional integration can't keep up, the speed and the size and the complexity of the information as it's moving from place to place uh, is just too much for traditional ETL systems, uh, traditional uh, enterprise EAI systems, things that I've built in the past, and even the ESBs uh, that were kind of built around the SOA movement. So understand that we have to continuously rethink the way in which we're approaching technology. Integration is no different, and ultimately, the existing approaches and the existing technology are going to fall short. So we have to rethink, uh, reinvent, uh, re-innovate the way in which we're approaching integration. So the next megatrend is the rise of services and now microservices change the game in terms of how we leverage and manage data. So in the olden days, you know, being via 10 years ago, when we had to communicate with databases, we did so, you know, typically using standard language uh, implementation, CLIs, calling language interfaces, APIs directly into the databases, and we communicated with the databases as kind of separate entities unto themselves. Moving forward, we're seeing the rise of services which is nothing new. We saw the rise of services around the service-oriented architecture movement that started you know, 10, 12 years ago. And now we have the ability to externalize major 
um, uh, data entities as services. Uh, so we're no longer talking directly to the database using whatever native language and a native interface that the database is ready to employ, but we're able to communicate with all of these various pieces of information, you know, via these services and microservices that we're standing up, which allow us to access and bring the data directly into applications, during, app, app, directly into portals, directly into other data systems, and then mix and match these data sources to form the analytical systems and the business systems and the composite applications that we need to create in order to solve the business problem. So we, we got to get out of the thinking that we always have to create the same sets of integration to the back-end databases as we build these applications. We're leveraging services that can be reused across these applications, across these composites, across these cloud systems, across these big data systems to bring the data asset, assets directly into us and allow us to solve problems in a much more faster and a much more agile way. The other mega trend is that those who don't understand the strategic value that new approaches to data integration will have in the emerging world uh, will end up being caught without the technology they need to be successful. So I, I get a call a week from people who are trying to take the existing approaches, patterns, uh, and technologies that they leveraged you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago and reapply them into big data systems, into data lakes and, and new versions of you know, how we're dealing with, with cloud-based systems and petabyte-scale databases, and, and they're falling short. And the reason they're falling short is because they were engineered to solve a particular static problem. And now that we're seeing the changes occur in terms of the types of information we're managing, structured and unstructured, how we're managing data, the ability to leverage services and the ability to leverage data that may be housed in remote systems that exist in cloud-based systems, the need to aggregate the information, manage the information, and deal with data governance and data quality and data security, all these things that weren't as important in the past are there now. And so naturally, just like any other evolution in technology, we have to change the way in which these systems are plumbed. We have to change the way in which these systems exchange information. And that is something either you can resist and try to take your existing technology and throw it at the problem and yell at your vendor for not getting you know, the things into their technology they need to get into, or you can take this as an opportunity to reinvent the way in which you do data integration, the way in which you approach the problem, and ultimately bringing more value into your enterprise by automating access to information that quite frankly you need to run your business and quite frankly will change your business if used effectively. So moving on, as data grows, enterprises are finding, you know, ultimately it's a mix of structured and unstructured data, and the relationships ultimately need to be derived somehow, typically within the middleware. So again, going back in the past with traditional data integration technology, I mean EAI, ETL, um, and, the, and ESB, we typically dealt with very structured information, typically the relational model. And so we communicated that using a standard mechanism. Everybody understood it. However, relational models and relational databases had their limitations. And so we moved to the NoSQL stuff, and then we moved into the big data systems and the ability to deal with structured and unstructured information, the ability to deal with massive amounts of data that carry on different structures and different formats and different governance uh, systems, different security environments, different uh, everything in terms of how this information is going to be thought after. So you have to derive the relationships between them, the structured and unstructured data, relational, non-relational, and you have to be able to, in essence, grow the systems and deal with the systems you know, using these sorts of interfaces. So you can't fight the complexity. The reality is, is that the information exists the way it exists, and we're leveraging the information as it exists in the data centers, as it exists in a file system, as it exists within the applications, as it exists within the databases, where it lies, and integration technology has to be able to bring it out and bring it together and form and reform it into solutions or views in how we move into the information. Fantastic. Right yes, very great, uh, you know, great, great overview, Dave. And as you're 
Uh, taking us through this, uh, I'm here with Gaurav who's uh, nodding his head uh, in agreement on some of these points. So let me bring you into the discussion, Gaurav. I mean, one of the fundamental questions there here, and, and we hear all the time, uh, especially as we talk to customers moving to Hadoop and you know, and embracing some of the newer analytics technologies, should we be building a data warehouse in, in 2015? You know, this is uh, this is interesting that there is this uh, these mega trends that are impacting people not only at a thought leadership level, but also at a pragmatic innovation level, where you have people who have to go about their daily jobs, they have to make sure that what they found or what they built in the past continues to run, and yet they can embrace new innovations and you know, not make sure they don't fall behind. Uh, so, so I think that's a pregnant question and a very appropriate question, because I, you know, frankly, um, I. If I were to be in a large company today, a global 2000 company today, I would very seriously think about just continuing to feed the data warehouse I already have rather than build new ones. You know, I think the traditional stack of the ETL product, which does batch production, et cetera, uh, having you know, some, some uh, RDBMS-based structure, maybe a data warehouse appliance, if you have the funds, maybe just a uh, big old machine with uh, Oracle or something on it, and then some BI reporting technology. I think that stack feels antiquated if you look at where people are today. Um, in, in my view, what we are seeing and what I would recommend people do is start to really think about redoing their data platform. You know, the, the amount of information being produced as a result of the megatrends that were very well outlined here by Dave is so much that you simply cannot, the, neither the volume nor the type of data can be squeezed into a traditional data warehouse no matter how much money you're willing to scale up that particular thing. So, so I would say very much people should stop building new ones you know, see if they can keep the old ones running. You know, you can still get parts for them and all that, so it's not like they're going to stop functioning. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, the financial reporting chain and the way companies roll together their annual reports, et cetera, lots of marketing departments are dependent on that information. But, but I think going into the future is going to be very different thing. So that, that, that does set up this conversation around the data lake. Uh, and we, we put this, uh, this statement here, do you sink with a data warehouse or do you swim in a data lake? So, so why a data lake? What does it look like to you? And, and why not, right? And why, and why not? not? Right, right. So, so again, you know, having been in the technology business for more years than I care to admit, the, the important thing in this business is to grab onto those things that have impact. For example, artificial intelligence was a little too artificial. It never quite made the impact that we thought it would have. Maybe now with advancements in machine learning, it will find uh, value on, on the uh, uh, sort of the output of some of the things that we are going to talk about here. But the fundamental sort of litmus test as to why you should not be building a traditional data warehouse is that the exhaust, the output from various web interactions, from things, the unstructured data types that are just washing over the traditional data warehouse capabilities are so large that there's no other way to deal with the unstructured data and the output of things and websites than to build a data link. There's just sim simply no practical way to deal with the upper end of hundreds of terabytes of data, petabytes of data, without doing that. And it's not that this is just for the few brave internet properties in the world. Everybody has this. You know, people who make aircraft engines are embracing the industrial internet. People who build uh, utility companies are looking at how you tackle um, the information that is available to you. People who make thermostats are now giving you smart in terms of how you can control heating and cooling and energy in your house. So, so this evolution of information and things is giving rise to the data lake, which is giving rise to sort of a new stack. So the, the data lake is a concept whose time has come. It, the, the, the output of things should go to a data lake. In fact, that's the only place it can be held. We should keep all the information that we can. And in addition to running our old data warehouses, we should probably have a feed from the traditional data warehouse, the stream, to use the uh, 
a water uh, analogy further, a stream from the traditional data warehouse out, uh, inputs or maybe even output of the traditional data warehouse be going into the data lake to supply additional information for the consumption of that information, right? So if you think of the, the new stack, the new stack is a capability to be able to provide information into the data lake through data wrangling, uh, data ingest, potentially even ELT, you would have extraction, you would put the information in there, and you do the transformation inside the data lake. Um, and the reason you want to do the transformation inside the data lake is the price performance of data transformations using technologies like Hadoop and in the future Spark and certain advancements and things like Mesos and others is at an unprecedented level, right? The, the world record in the sort, the sorting Olympics is held by Apache Spark. You know, they managed to do faster sort with fewer machines. There's some stats on the web. Anybody can Google it in a way that is not possible using any other technology. So, so this evolution to a new stack, a data lake, we think is going to win out. And the new stack is you have connective tissue that feeds the data lake. You have a data platform that is typically some Hadoop or some other variant of it, like an evolution towards Spark. And you have a new audience using the data lake there may be data scientists, there may be people using visualization products, et cetera. Great. Great overview. And uh, I want to give you a chance to respond to that, uh, Dave. But uh, I want to bring the, 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 the folks that are actually listening to, to today's discussion live. We have many people that will be listening on recordings and podcast versions of it. Um, for those of you who are out there today with us, um, the question is, what is causing your organization to rethink your approach to data integration? Is it cloud applications and microservices? Is it big data volume, variety, velocity, some of the things Gaurav talked about? Is it the Internet of Things, all of the above, or you're simply researching and trying to uh, figure this out for, for your organization? So take a second to, uh, to give us uh, your, your thoughts on what's happening in your organization. And I want to bring you back in, Dave, to, just to get your thoughts on, on Gaurav's uh, take on the data lake and whether you should be building a data warehouse in 2015. No, I couldn't agree more. I think that... Um uh, uh, data warehouses certainly had a time and value, uh, but ultimately the way in which we're, we're going to aggregate and deal with massive amounts of information need to change. I mean, one of the things that uh, I was very impressed when data warehousing started to emerge is we're thinking in terms of the value that data finally has. I just wasn't very impressed with the approaches uh, that in many instances that we had. So ultimately, you know, the data assets, um, you know, as they exist in the data lake concept, are, are just more valuable. We're able to do the integration within those systems. We're able to aggregate them. We're able to link them together. We're able to manage metadata together, and we're able to deal like information the way we should deal with it. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's many things in many places and many physical instances. And but the value remains the same. And I think that we need to kind of give up on the concept. We're going to take everything and suck it out of the operational data stores and, you know, stick it in this massively honking big data warehouse and then have everything be, be right with the world. I, I think that's a fantasy. That, that ultimately isn't working. So the data lake concept and the ability to kind of move in that direction, I think is going to uh, provide a ton more value within the enterprises than we saw in the past. Great. And it's, look, it's interesting to see the poll results here. Uh, there's a, a large percentage of folks that are just researching, which is understandable. This is a lot of new, uh, a lot of change and a lot of things that are new. Um, a good percentage is 30% uh, is all of the above, which is nice to see. And then cloud applications and microservices are really uh, the primary driver today of rethinking the approach to data integration. So a lot about that, you know, integrating um, cloud applications like Salesforce and Workday and ServiceNow with on-premises systems for that hybrid uh, cloud application portfolio. So great. So that's, that's the first part of what we wanted to, to cover. Now let's get into uh, a few of the, the sort of adjacent topics around the megatrends and some of these shifts in data. So the first question I'll, I'll, I'll have you go first, Gaurav, is when it comes to integration, do we still need to be thinking you know, and deciding between big versus fast? It seemed like that was always the case in the integration world. You had one style of integration for apps and real time and another style for batch and, and kind of ETL. Yes, the dump truck versus the FedEx truck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Darren, things have changed. You know, we've come a long way. We've come a long way in terms of Moore's Law, the price of storage, the ability to spin up technologies out of the World Wide Web like a horizontal scale-out capability. 
You can have both. It is, it is often the case that you see people able to obtain both. There, there may be boundary conditions, bleeding edge, if you would, boundary conditions, you know, fly-by-wire, triple seven, you know, your airliner or a hedge fund trying to figure out the edge of the envelope, the finest, finest molecule on high-speed trading uh, like that. There may be petabytes and petabytes of information that are coming out of a nuclear super collider at Berkeley or Stanford where you may want to use other technologies. But for almost all of us, you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, and it's very clear that that's possible with the technologies that are available today. Hmm. Now, Dave, these have been colliding for years in the on-prem world, you know, EAI and ETL. Uh, are, you, you know, are you seeing the same thing from your, your customers? Uh, what's your take on this fast versus uh, big integration? Yeah, they, they always think there's a, there's a trade-off. And, and the question will come, like, can, you know, can we do fast, you know, massive, massively fast data transfer from – you know, source to targets, including cloud to on-premise, and and you know, our you know, how do we handle these big systems where we're doing we need to do weekly updates? And you know, I'm like, you got to do both. I mean, information is in is not valuable if it's not if it's not uh, um, current. And so, you know, this understanding that we have to you know go after different integration solutions based on the ma based on the amounts of data. And the speed of data is is an archaic way of thinking. I mean, we had to deal with those 20 years ago just because we had limitations in the technology. The point that was just made, and, and I think going forward, um, we don't. And there's no reason you can't assemble the right architecture in terms of a data integration solution, which provides you with fast and provides you with big. And I think that enterprises need to kind of understand that they need to challenge some of the limitations of the existing vendors that are in there, risk bringing in their ear in terms of you know, what limitations exist within their technology and then transferring those limitations to the way in which they deal with their architecture. Um, information, data, uh, is your primary asset. You can do wonderful things with it. You can determine lots of things about your business you don't know. And you, by the way, you can take these analytics and you can embed them into your processes. So there's automated and orchestrated uh, business processes that can exist and in an essence function on their own with near perfect information. And to get there, you need both big and you need both fast. So let's not compromise, guys. Yep, great, great point. So let's, let's actually do a quick polling question on that topic. It's the last polling question we have, um, but we wanted to try to get people involved. So what's the future of the enterprise service bus at your uh, organization? I'm seeing more and more, uh, you know, that's been written about the ESB. I mean, very few organizations are making the big investment in a, in a big on-prem ESB in 2015. Um, so the question, uh, from what I've seen, so are you using it for on-premise requirements only? Are you using it uh, or planning to use it for cloud services and microservices types of integration? Or are you looking to move towards a more flexible and agile platform? So it seems like the enterprise service bus uh, might be a uh, you know, really prime, prime opportunity to rethink that in particular. And then let me get your take on that, Dave. I mean, you, you've you've written books on on you know SOA and you know talked a lot about ESB over the years. Are you seeing that change? And what's your what's your advice to folks on the on the ESB front? Yeah, I, I think the the uh, days of the e my ESB will save me are are long over. Uh, so ultimately, uh, enterprise service buses are certain technologies that have particular tactical applications in some instances. You know, however, as we're moving into cloud and moving to large data sets and data lakes and all the things we saw in the past, um, the, f the limitations of that, like I just mentioned in the previous, when we talked about the previous limitations, are, are being better understood. And, and so, you know, enterprise service buses, you know, certainly were, are good technology. There's limitations in there. There's, there's things you can't do with it. There's things you can do with it. But ultimately, as you start moving in this direction, don't limit yourself to it. Don't, you know, so everything's going to run back to my ESB, where now that I'm moving to, you know, cloud-scale systems and web-scale systems and petabyte, you know, size, you know, databases that are out there as the big data stuff starts to emerge. And you just can't force-fit that technology anymore, I'm sorry to say, and that's just something I think people within enterprises need to get over with. And the good news from the polling response is uh, C is the overwhelming uh, winner in terms of, uh, you know, organizations looking to move towards a more flexible and agile platform. 67%. Uh, yeah, I, I would, there, yeah, I would say that not only did people not buy big ESPs in 2014, I don't think they bought them in 2013 either, <laughs> quite likely. Um, but, you know, uh, to echo Dave's comments here, he, he came up with the term EAI and knows more about this field than many. 
uh, latecomers uh, to, to this industry. But I would say, you know, what was shocking to me, we intrinsically felt this from the, what we saw, the work that was going on and how people were moving away. But what was sort of an eye-opener for me is, you know, Martin Fowler, probably one of the other big brains in the industry, just came sort of came out, threw his hands up in the air, and he has essentially a presentation on the web. You can look on his website that says, is this your ESB? In other words, he's saying, oh, my God, what did we do? What have we rocked with this thing? Like, this becomes this dinosaur. It's, it was supposed to be doing things, but on the other hand, it has become like this, you know, parking brake that is on inside the enterprise, and it's, it's um, not going to be the solution for the long-term future. And then he describes microservices in detail. But, but I, I would say this notion of a message bus is uh, not applicable in some of the ways in which we use cloud computing. So, for example, you've gone to all this time and effort to try to get a message bus going. You make a round trip up to a cloud application like a Salesforce. You make a round trip back. Why did you install a very fast message bus if you're going to be putting messages on the public Internet? So from a you know, very tactical perspective, that starts to break some of those things. And secondly, you know, this notion that you can have lots and lots of people building their own protocols and figuring out the containerization of data and that sort of breakdown that almost always happens is, is causing a dramatic slowdown in the ingest of ESB as an ultimate solution. Well, not to mention how uh, quickly these cloud applications change. Right? Right. So how do you manage change when the old days, the application didn't change as frequently uh, as they certainly do in the cloud? Um, so good. I mean, good, good discussion about the service bus. It seems like uh, there's some, some shifting happening in thinking, um, which is, is always encouraging on the innovation front. So bringing it back to the, the data warehouse versus the data lake and, and, and you know, we don't want to throw away uh, concepts and you know, important areas around data governance and data quality. Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that the information that is fed downstream is of high quality? And you know, so the question we have for you both, and, and you can take this one first, Gaurav, is, is data quality still re relevant? Yeah, I'll, yes. I'll, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Dave. Uh, you want me go to go? Ahead, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. you go first. Okay. So, so I'd say um, uh, that, you know, yes and no, right? The first thing you do with big data is you make small data out of it. So you can use some very clever analytics technology, sort of the, you know, data feeds on data, the kinds of data science algorithms and capabilities that we didn't possess because we didn't have the computers to run them at scale in, in you know, back in my father's data warehouse kind of day. So, so, on the one hand, I don't think data quality matters when you ingest information at the data lake. I think you should capture everything. You should put everything in there because, to my view, it's not that you need data quality. It's just that our algorithms aren't clever enough to figure out signal from the noise. What may appear to be noise today may have signal, and why would we throw out data that could have value later on? Because, you know, it, it's certainly not the cost. You know, we, it's so affordable to gather so much information that I believe we should not think of data quality in the old school ETL way. Rather, we should get the information and have it available to us. Now, when we wrangle that information, when we make a smaller data set of that big data lake that we have or whatever pond we're going to go fishing in, at that point, we should then impose filtration quality, other kinds of narrowing down of that, excuse me, narrowing down of that information so we can get better signal, better data science results from it. And uh, so, so I think it's completely, completely different in the modern world than it used to be 20 years ago. And, and we've talked about data at rest versus data at flight, in flight uh, is, is a big concept that to think about when it comes to data, data quality. Dave, what's your take on data quality? I know you spend a lot of time with uh, your clients on, on this topic in particular. Yeah, I thought the thoughts, I mean, just to echo the thoughts that were just that were stated, I thought were spot on. I think that, you know, ultimately uh, you think about data quality in terms of how you're going to extract the information and then putting some governance and some policies and some data quality systems around around that because it is kind of part of the analytical process. And so if you put it into the analytical domain, I love the, I, I love the making uh, small data out of big data. I think that's a, that's a good way to state it. Um, that's where data quality can be dealt with best because you can do the cross-checking, you can do the validation, you can do you know the uh, you know data structure, quality assurance, you know all the kind of the, the the lifting and tackling it takes to do it. But 
there's no reason we can't throw everything in anything, you know, since we're dealing with very primitive pieces of information now, as unstructured information is, you know, into the data lake, uh, into the big data system, and then deal with data quality issues on extraction. And the thing is, governance policies, all those sorts of things, typically innate within competent data integration tools and analytical tools, and that's where you leverage them. So you don't throw anything away. I mean, everything has value. Um, you know, I kind of look at it as, uh, you know, uh, the way in which they mine gold. I mean, they just take massive amounts of dirt, you know, and sift through it and separate the uh, and separate the gold directly from, you know, thousands and thousands of yards of soil. And they do that when they extract it. And I think we should deal with data in much the same way. Hmm. Yep. Great. Great. I mean, this is a. Uh one of the, the, the tweets that I saw coming in and uh, leading up to this, this presentation was, are we going to uh, make the same mistakes we've made for years in the data warehouse as organizations embrace the data lake? Um, and so I think there's certainly opportunity to make sure we, we, we learn from those mistakes. Uh, don't repeat them, but don't just try to doing the same things, uh, you know, the same, same old way and expecting different results. So this, this will be a hot topic, I think, going forward. Uh, bringing in topics like governance and, and, and quality. Another one uh, that we were talking about leading up to this discussion, uh, Dave, and I know this is an area that you think a lot about, is data privacy. Uh, what are the obligations, what are the responsibilities, and, and how do we secure our, our data? Well, I, I think we're obligated to deal with data privacy. I think, uh, you know, for lots of pragmatic reasons, the fact of the matter is we don't want uh, uh, business data that's going to compromise our ability to do the business externalized out of the organization. All we have to do is talk to Sony and a few of the other, you know, kind of reach in and, uh, and target recent data breaches going out, you know, going out today. So our obligation is to secure the information to the degree of the requirements of the information needs to be secured. And that's going to vary from organization to organization, but that's kind of a fundamental thing that goes on. The other thing that we have to kind of think of going forward uh, in terms of data privacy is the ability to kind of make sense of lots of data that may be uh, not necessarily as secure, but when brought together into an aggregation or some sort of analytics uh, provides information you probably don't want to externalize. So we have to think about information in terms of not only the information itself in its raw format, but the ability to kind of combine it with other things out there on the web or in the enterprise or uh, on unstructured data systems, now that these capabilities are there, to really kind of, you know, find out things about people and businesses and things like that you may not want to be uh, externalized. So those are the obligations that are needed, and you need to have somebody who has expertise in data security and making sure that we're dealing with, you know, data security in flight, data security at rest, both, you know, each depending on the requirements, and then dealing with the right mechanisms. Um, right now, uh, dealing with cloud computing and web scale systems, there's very few instances where I wouldn't provide, you know, very good encryption uh, mechanisms as data exists in REST and in flight uh, for various of my clients, especially the ones with more sensitive information that has to be there. So those mechanisms are there. They're typically paired with your data integration tools. You need to figure out, you know, which ones are going to meet your particular needs. But there's always going to be some data security, you know, issue that kind of comes along for the ride. So data privacy is your responsibility. Data pri you're the, you have the obligation to make sure the information is not externalized to people who are unauthorized to see it. You as IT have the responsibility, and there's lots of technology out there to leverage uh, that you can use um, to secure your data. So, so I want to bring Garv into this. Uh, to, you, you want to make a couple of points, yeah, and, just, and then just we also have some questions uh, yeah, that's coming in from the audience. Yeah, I think uh, we should. Those are always fun. So, I think the look, uh, Dave's covered it really well. You know, I think uh, data privacy, to my mind, is sort of almost a debate at a society level. You know, where do we go from? Can it be used for good? Or can it be used for evil? You know, sort of this Big Brother versus you know. What if we could uh, find things ahead of time and not get breaches like Sony? I mean, uh, the relative who works there, it, it, it's a mess. They can't use email. You're meeting in the lunchroom and other people. It's back to walking around, management by walking around in an amazing way. So, so, um, so I think this, this, uh, the data security piece, though, is a very important one because there are certain really good emerging technologies around the data lake. In our work with Cloudera and Hortonworks, we're finding, particularly in FinServe, they're using Kerberos to have authentication on a role basis on a particular RC file or some data subset inside the data lake is providing people the ability to massively tackle this information in a massive way 
and yet be able to keep it secure as much as you possibly can without not having it, right? So there's a sort of a mathematical limit to how secure you can be, and uh, these are the limits that are being approached. And I think the, the last thing I would say is uh, data gravity plays a key role in this. I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways you can burst out and burst in, a lot of secure ways to keep data at rest and in flight, for example, using Kerberos, using other kind of encryption technologies, and uh, I think they're very effective. Hmm. Yeah, good point. And, and so, 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 Dave, I want to bring you back in. A question uh, came up, and there's been a few, and I'm going to bring, bring some of these questions in towards the end of the discussion. But this one was really um, relevant for this part of the discussion. Um, if someone was starting to uh, – oh, sorry. In regulated industries, uh, where, do you see data governance and, where do you see data governance and lineage playing uh, an important role? You know, how is that being managed and, and audited in the data lake? Uh, have you got some uh, answers on that at this point, or is it still early, too early – uh, in the evolution and implementation cycle of a data lake? Well, it can't be too early because it's uh, compliance means that you're going to get in trouble if you don't do it. So you have to read the, you know, the letter in the, uh, in the spirit of the law and make sure the technology you're leveraging remains compliant. Uh, there's nothing that I see within HIPAA and, uh, you know, some of the other financial uh, regulatory, you know, IT requirements out there that make a data lake uh, not possible because obviously we've been doing things like that for years. You have to be very careful, though, in terms of how you deal with auditing and when the information's persisted uh, and your ability to kind of get at it, you know, during the audit so you can pass the audits. And so that's the only thing to think about. The, the good news is I think the tools that we have today are much more easier to use around compliance issues. And so the way in which we did it a few years ago were very very arcane. I mean, they would just kind of write things usually via FTP, you know, down to some file system where it was encrypted, and that's kind of the way the log was done. You know, now within these uh, these tools that we have uh, today in terms of data management, analytics, and integration, logging systems are typically innate. They're used to those sorts of compliance regulate uh, compliance uh, uh, adherence issues, and uh, you should be able to manage your information within compliance better today than you did with the tools you were using 20, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Certainly the uh, ESBs are an example for that. Uh, they weren't very good at managing compliance, logging, things like that. They had to be uh, programmed around. Uh, now the data integration tools are much more, uh, much better at dealing with that. Great. So we're going to take a few more questions, so keep them coming in. But uh, I do want to, to hit on this last uh, key topic that's sort of adjacent to all of this, which is the Internet of Things. Um, and I'll ask you this question, Gaurav, I mean, is, it, is it overhyped? <laughs> if there's anything overhyped in the world, it's <laughs> probably the Internet of Things. It is overhyped, right? Like, like anything that is trending, like anything that starts to capture the gestalt, sort of the essence of a particular time, in, in my view, the Internet of Things are capturing the spirit of why you need a data lake, what, what makes big data relevant. There's some really thoughtful pieces on that. I, in particular, I'm a huge fan of GE's industrial internet thought, people, uh, thought play, uh, pieces that show pragmatically how certain vertical industries at a global level, national level, can be impacted, how a, a company the size of a, you know, of a, <laughs> of a small country uh, with the same revenue as a GDP of a small country can change its future and look to its roots as a technology company and so on. So, so it is overhyped, but there's a lot of goodness there. You know, uh, there are some amazing things going on in the world of sensors. Being able to manage how we maintain the flow of water, right? The scarcest, scarcest commodity with the falling oil prices in our planet might actually be water. So how do you uh, do a better job of watering your fields? Uh, what sensor technology can be applied to agriculture? I mean, this is on a global scale, a shape shifter has massive implications for how companies like ours and others transmit that information, you know, process that information, provide predictive forward thinking analytics on that information. Uh, so the, these sorts of things I think are absolutely huge. But but that combination, going back to the sink or swim, swim in the data lake or sink with the uh, old approach, I think becomes very relevant. Because when you have information from things coming in into a data lake, you can apply not just the rear view mirror reporting that you could in the old data warehouse, but you can now apply predictive analytics to look ahead. You have a concept of an aircraft engine that is giving you information on when it should be maintained at a, at a, in a very good way, not just mechanically, but how many hours were flown. You have a capability of somebody in the thermal 
power generation business or being able to see the hot spots in a $10 million steam turbine and being able to predict from the hot spots when to take down that boiler for maintenance rather than wait for an outage. Uh, you can change how oil exploration is done by looking at that information in a predictive manner. So, so there's some really big breakthroughs. I won't even touch medicine because that is a webinar all on its own. But there's some big, big breakthroughs here that will come. Uh, it is overhyped, but there's reality there. Oh, great, great overview. Dave, uh, want to add to that? Yeah, it is overhyped, but I'm a uh, embedded systems geek from way back when, so I'm, I'm, I kind of like the fact that it's overhyped because I think we're seeing value in communicating with devices that, quite frankly, has always been there. Uh, we just haven't really understood it as much. And now with the advent of cloud and uh, also some marketing dollars that are behind this, you know, via some of the larger companies that are promoting the Internet of Things, we kind of see it. But, you know, um, you know, in my early days, when I first got it started with with data integration, I was doing high speed data acquisition for NASA, and, and you know, writing uh, interfaces into devices so we can pull information as quickly as we could off them, and actually take the information, process it, and make core decisions instantaneously or near instantaneously for the best processing power we could at the time to make decisions as to you know how to manage a control uh, a clean room, how to manage uh, devices, you know how to manage things in space, all those sorts of things and it's just entirely interesting to me to this point it's almost it's a hobby for of mine mine uh, as well. But I'm looking at my Nest thermostat which by the way is Internet of Things device it's going to be participating in the smart grid system this uh, this summer and actually do some load shedding um, you know based on the needs of the grid to make sure we we can avoid building power centers things like that. And moving forward with all these massive amounts of value that can be delivered, now that we're able to acquire and process information off of these devices. And so we just didn't have that many of them that were producing information. You know, now that we do, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can do with it. It's just the mind boggles. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it, medicine's a big thing, and you know, our heart rate monitors, all these other things that are around. So it is overhyped. For sure, it's something that's been around for a long period of time, but there's a tremendous amount of value there I think we haven't tapped into yet. Well, I can just, uh, the energy, uh, your your own energy on this topic is uh, is powerful. Um, so clearly it's an area that you're excited about. Uh, now, you know, we could have had a webinar on each of these topics uh, or a podcast, and there's just so much here. I want to start to take a few questions, uh, but before I do that, um, I'll, I'll set you up with the first, a first question as you give, go through a few do's and don'ts, Dave. The question we got here is, um, how do we manage the migration from old way of data integration to the new way? So it's a little bit of a you know, setup for your do's and don'ts. So I'll leave you with that as you're taking us through some of your recommendations, and then bring Gaurav in for his. Okay, well, just kind of addressing the question directly, you know, ultimately you have to have a plan and understanding where your to-do state, as your as-is state is, and what's working and what's not, and then figure out what your to-do state or your, your to-be state or your vision needs to be, and what's the path to get there. I can't, you know, state it any simpler. And having said that, you've got a tremendous amount of people issues and technology issues and money issues and leadership issues that you have to go through. And I spend years and years and years working with clients that are moving through these very difficult things. But the reality is, if you don't, you're going to miss the boat on lots of stuff, and you're going to end up in trouble in a few years. I think in terms of your ability to leverage your data assets, even your ability to kind of keep up with the integration that needs to occur between your application, your data silos, uh, your cloud-based systems that are emerging, your big data systems, data lakes, all these sorts of things can come into play. So that's a hard question to answer specifically for what you need, but look at where you are, where you need to go, look at what the delta is, and put a reasonable plan together in terms of how you're going to get there. So a couple of recommendations that I have is, number one, do understand your own data, data integration requirements and how things will change in the next uh, five to ten years, which, I, which is a question I just answered. So you, you got to have a visionary in the company who's able to kind of put things on the radar screen as to what you need to do to, to bring additional value into the organization via some of the IT assets that you have. Data integration is a key enabler for that stuff and how you need to change your architectures, your data integration approaches, and your technology going forward. And a lot of the things we talked about in this webinar, you know, really kind of go to that. And there, there has to be a group of people and a budget and money and funding, in, you know, which is dedicated to doing this because not missing this boat, missing the ability to kind of leverage your data assets effectively uh, is going to be everything for, for most businesses out there. 
to find the value of the strategic use of data for your business. And one of the things that uh, I always start out with uh, before I come in there and you know sell data integration as a concept, and I think it's yeah, I think everybody's bought it. They just want to know how much they have to pay for it, how much value they can get from it. Is what is the real value? And this goes to the board of directors. In many instances, I'm presenting to the CEO, I'm presenting to the CFO, I'm presenting to the board of directors in terms of why we need to make this investment in 30 million, 50 million dollars you know, over the next several years in leveraging our data assets more effectively and efficiently. And that's moving into data lakes, moving into big data systems, moving into, uh, you know, uh, data integration technology that can keep up with cloud computing and petabyte scale databases, and we can get the fast and big at the same time and all the things we talked about in the webinar. So if you're able to define the value that comes back into the business, which you have to be able to do, it's easy to make the business case. You need to spend all these millions of dollars uh, to go make these things happen. And it's fairly easy to do these days. It's easy to find the value of integration. It's, it's relatively uh, uh, straightforward and continues to be more straightforward going forward. Don't ignore the growth and increasing complexity of the data. Uh, you guys are dealing with, uh, with relational databases, and that was it. You know, tables and nothing but tables. Uh, those days are over, and so it's documents, and it's massive amounts of, of video, uh, binary video information, audio information, uh, you know, uh, sensor data. We just talked about the Internet of Things that, you know, can be all kinds of odd uh, data structures, and uh, you're going to have to deal with it. So the ability to kind of place it outside of your domain that you can't manage it because you don't have the capabilities, that's not the answer. The answer is how you're going to consume that information and make it work and play well uh, within the existing systems. And then don't ignore the need to secure and govern data. Security and governance, um, we talked about it in this webinar, but in many instances is an afterthought. And so, you know, I'm the annoying guy in the room that, you know, kind of raises his hand and talks about that. Where is encryption going to exist? Where is security going to exist? Data at rest, data in flight. How are we going to govern the information, deal with data quality, put policies around the use of information, deal with compliance things, things like that. That has to be systemically built into the data integration approach and solution that you're, that you're moving to. So don't ignore it, because if you do, it's going to end up biting you in the butt and cost you a tremendous amount of, uh, more, a lot money, more money than you need to spend to go back and fix it. Great, great, great overview, great uh, set of recommendations. Um, I'm going to bring you into this as well, Gaurav. We've also got a question that I think is uh, aligned with um, some of the points that Dave made and I think you're making. Um, the question is, how do I get information technology uh, to understand that size and fast matters, not how much data needs to be transported? I constantly am asked, how much data am I going to transport so IT resources can be allocated to my data? So right, the question right. for you, and then I think we'll leave, you know, wrap up with some do's and don'ts. Great, great. So I think it's a, it's a vital question because everybody's struggling to get their heads around big and fast. Right? And I think a simple way to think about this is to think about momentum. Right? So when this person who asked the question has a conversation back with whoever is asking them to provide this, is look, think of momentum. In a sense, you have a mass of data and a velocity of data, and when you multiply mass times velocity, you get momentum. So you should think of the momentum of data. How much do you have? How fast do you want it? Because they are related. Here's why. In modern technologies, you know, SAPLogic, just a little commercial for us, being an example, but there are others. In modern technologies, you have a web scale, web type of architecture, so you have a horizontal scale out approach to tackling big and fast. So, so you can, in a sense, look at how much data momentum you have, uh, it, regardless of whether it's coming for the cloud things or you know, in running in Hadoop or Spark, and you can then, sorry, <laughs> that always, always happens, right? Give us a second. We have a fire truck going by. Uh, there's there's a fire burning time. in the IT yeah, that's right. Uh, it's an important topic. It caught fire. Uh, hot topic. So, so the the uh, horizontal scale out approach lets you tackle big and fast by adding more, in a sense, processing to it. You know, so you can have elastic load balancers. You can put processing nodes to tackle these things depending on the momentum. If you want it to be a lot faster within certain, you know, uh, outer boundaries like we described. The worst thing you can do now is to maintain the status quo uh, if, because things are changing whether you like it or not. And the use of data and the strategic use of data and how we're storing data and how we're utilizing data, how we're governing data, how we're securing data is something that evolves all the time. So I've been in the integration space 
you know, since I wrote the EAI book in the, ni- in the, in the mid-90s, and the reality is we reinvented that space 20 times. And most enterprises may have re- reinvented that space uh, a couple of times. Uh, and so you need to basically figure out that this is something that is, is at the top priority of these organizations, and you either have to, you're either going to have to grow and change or you're going to have to uh, run into existing problems and accept the fact that uh, um, and, and, and basically run into the fact you're not able to add value to the business. Right. So couldn't agree with you more, Dave. And but uh, but uh, but just to get back to some of the do's and don'ts and the pragmatic uh, answer I was trying to give was, look, do innovate. Uh, as Dave is pointing out, do innovate. It's refreshingly inexpensive to do so. You know, we like to joke about you can have a data, you can have a elephant in your closet where the elephant is really um, the Hadoop uh, a set of things that you can put into your closet quite inexpensively. We had one of our young fresh hires out of grad school, put together a 72 terabyte Hadoop cluster in our closet, uh, and it didn't even need um, any um, air conditioning or anything, and to get 74 terabytes for $10,000 was really fun, and it's been the foundation of much of the work that we've done, and it's obviously grown. It's going to be a couple hundred terabytes pretty soon, and probably a petabyte by the end of the year, the way things are going. So jump in. A lot of the technologies are free and open source. The hardware is easily available. In the future, we'll publish a blog entry about sort of the bill of materials to get your own uh, data pond or something going. The and you can uh, get the elephant in your club. So I'd say play with it. Uh, but do keep a firm grip on ROI. Uh, this has been, I think, a hallmark of the data warehousing industry where the information has been quantified as valuable. People depend on it. People run their businesses on it. As we think of forward-looking predictive analytics and new kinds of at-scale uh, data lake and data science problems, we've got to keep a grip on ROI. You know, this is where some of the agency models, sort of your national government-funded initiatives, they, they don't have to respond to shareholders. They don't have to respond to the return on investment versus other IT projects. So I think it's very important to do this with a firm grip on ROI. And I would say, last but not least, don't settle for the same old, same old. It's a very exciting time. It's been decades since we've had such an interesting time in the industry of data. And this is a fantastic time to be a practitioner, and all these technologies are available easily, inexpensively, and it's time to retool and take advantage of them. Great. Well, with that, that uh, brings us to the end of uh, a very lively discussion. Um, and I, w- I just want to thank both of the speakers, uh, Dave Linthicum and Garth Dillon, for sharing your thoughts and uh, you know, keeping it lively. It was a very uh, – I learned a lot, took a lot of notes. Um, I do want to also make a, a quick plug here. Uh, Dave has written a very interesting white paper that, that takes some of his thoughts to the next level of detail. It's called The Death of Traditional Data Integration, um, and it's very comprehensive and some, some real insights on how to actually do this and how not to do it uh, going forward. So you can find that uh, at the SnapLogic website uh, under resources. Um, Dave, give, give you the final thoughts, final word. Yeah, go make things happen, guys. Data is going to change the world in terms of our ability to utilize it and uh, leverage it effectively within, within the business. No matter if you're a paper company or a high-tech company or a high-end finance company with billions of dollars in terms of IT assets, uh, now's the time to rethink the way in which we're dealing with information. And you need to get at it now if you haven't been so already. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we look forward to uh, engaging with you further. Um, please visit snaplogic.com for, for more information.